All right, hey there. Uh, Welcome to the Boyd Clocks podcast. We're going to go over the history of Boyd Clocks, how things got going. I am David Boyd, second generation of Boyd Clocks. And I am uh, J.R. Leslie. I'm third generation of Boyd Clocks. And I'm John Posner. I am not related to uh, Boyd Clocks whatsoever. But he's our producer, so he's here with us. <laughs> so he has to be a part of things. Um, so we're briefly going to go over kind of the, the history, um, kind of a general outline summary of how the clock shop got started as uh, kind of the first thing to give you an idea of what the shop's like and how everything here got going. Um, so this all began with my, my grandpa, uh, my uncle right here's father, uh, David Boyd Sr. And uh, he, <clears throat> he was born in 1930. And... Um, his parents had had many struggles with um, having a child to begin with, but uh, he was he was born in 1930 after several previous unsuccessful attempts, and he would be their only child. Um, and so, obviously, that makes a, a big difference. Um, you know, there's a lot of jokes and stuff about only only ch- children and the things that kind of make them different. And Grandpa was different, but for um, for reasons besides those that you normally hear hear in jokes. And so, um, it was very obvious from a very young age that grandpa, uh, David Boyd, was gifted with mechanic mechanics, that he just had a lot of natural ability and know-how ar- around different types of mechanical things, whether it was clocks or cars or erector sets. It didn't matter what it was, he would put it together, take it apart, and he could figure things out. Um, and even from a very young age, he started working on clocks little alarm clocks, uh, mostly that he got from actually troops stationed out at McDill uh, Air Force Base. Um, It it got around because his father would bring guys back home um, on the weekends to give them another place to stay, uh, especially during the war. It kind of got around that their son, David Boyd, would work on and could repair alarm clocks, which were really important for them because back then that was the kind of the one way that you knew how to get to work on time because they didn't have phones or anything like that. It was you had a clock, and that was the one thing that was going to get you out of bed at that time in the morning. Um, but uh, Grandpa, he loved clocks, but he loved other things more, and one of those was cars. And so he always hoped that one day he could go and work for Ford Motors at, in, in some capacity. And um, But that dream was kind of cut short when, at the age of 19, he contracted uh, polio. And at this time, there wasn't any type of um, uh, readily available treatment or vaccination. And it was a, this was part of an epidemic that actually swept the whole country. And um, it was actually even uncertain for a while whether or not he, my, my grandfather, David, would even live. Um, there was a newspaper article, and I can't remember. Yeah, the Tampa Tribune yeah. <laughs> uh, came out in 1949. And I don't know where the article is. We need to hang it up on the wall here in our shop. But it said that David Boyd of Hyde Park has contracted polio and is going to go to Warm Springs, Georgia, and is not expected to make it back. So, our local paper gave him a little bit of a death sentence, um, if you will, at 19 years old. And so, ever since, um, at about that time, it became obvious that, um, despite the fact that he was sent to a treatment facility, he was going to lose the use of his legs, and he was going to be crippled from the waist down for the rest of his life. So, uh, ever since, ever after that, he was forced to be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And one of the most incredible things was at his funeral, um, when we talked about it, no one could remember him ever once complaining about being in a wheelchair for the rest of his life, 19 to 85, uh, 66 years, um, which was a wonderful testament to the type of uh, man that Grandpa was. But 19, he contracts polio and... uh, From here, you can take it. Yeah, well, the United States was not wheelchair friendly. Um, He wanted to work for Ford Motor Company, and he was in his first year of college with the idea of uh, getting engineering degrees and and, uh, following the career path that he chose to work for Ford Motor Company. Now, 1949, the United States did not have the handicap provisions that they do today. You know, bathroom doors need to be a certain width, and you need to have ramps and elevators and and parking spaces and all these things to help people in wheelchairs get around. Uh, The United States was not ready for an epidemic uh, that left so many hundreds of thousands in a wheelchair, Um, but he was the kind of person that made the best of of what he uh, had to deal with 
And he said to himself, well, you know what? I'm stuck in a wheelchair and I'm not gonna go be able to work uh, for Ford Motor Company. Fine, I, I do like clocks and I've already established a, a little following with clocks. So I'll just continue on with um, college and I'll change my degrees around a little bit and I'll work on clocks. So, um, but that wasn't when he made his first money working on clocks. He made um, the first few dollars working on clocks when he was 14, uh, which would have been in 1944. And so that's what we count as the first year of Boyd clocks is when he started making a little bit of money on the side working on clocks. And he uh, continued making money, you know, as he was uh, 15, 16, 17, all the way up till 19. He was still making money uh, working on clocks. Uh, but it was because of polio that he decided to make it turn into a career, a full-time occupation, and and uh, and he was a great guy. He um, never, I never heard him complain about being in a wheelchair. And my mother, his wife of 55 years, never heard him complain about being in a wheelchair. And that's one of the reasons we want to continue on, uh, keep this business going, uh, to honor a man who handled his obstacles as well as he did and, and he did a lot for the community too he did a lot of volunteer stuff and uh, there were things he did at his church and there were things he did in his community uh, to help other people so uh, as a testament to what a great guy we think he is we're keeping his business going and it's in its 75th year he died four years ago um, in his 71st year of his career if you can imagine careers going that long but even as he got older, he loved mechanics. And um, he didn't want to um, stay at home and watch the game shows in his retirement or any of that stuff. And um, one of the funniest stories, um, I'll jump ahead a few years and then we'll go back, but one of, one of the funniest stories, after he had died, we had him cremated. And I, it was either my mother or my sister, um, JR's mother, who we're gonna take care of the ashes. And we had decided on where we were gonna spread them or what we were gonna do with them. Um, in fact, I took six months off to really kind of just mourn his loss and decide what I was gonna do with the clock shop. Uh, because all of my reasons for being in the clock business were, uh, they revolved around him and making sure that he had help in his later years and make sure he had a clock shop uh, that he could go to uh, as he wanted to. And so as he died, the last of my goals of being in, or reasons of being in the clock shop, um, went with him. And uh, so I took six months to mourn and decide what we were going to do. Well, the recession um, had uh, really pulled the rug out from underneath us, and, and that was a hard time for us. And I remember Dad saying, oh, we'll get busy again. And I kept telling him, um, and I called him in third party because of, you know, my kids and, and uh, some of the you know, he had grandkids that were coming in all the time, and then so I'm like, Grandpa, the world of clocks is over. It's gone. It's dead, and it's going the way of the typewriter, the mechanical typewriter, you know, the, the encyclopedias and dictionaries and camcorders and cameras and maps. There's a lot of things that the, the modern-day telephone has taken the place of, and clocks is one of them. And we were very slow during the recession, and um, but he said, no, we're gonna get busy again. And I'll be darned if, as the recession was ending, we started getting really busy, busier than, than we had ever been. And, and there were two major reasons for that. One of them was there was kind of a log jam of, of clocks that people were waiting to work on as the recession ended, and they weren't sure how financial um, things were gonna go. So they kind of held on to their money. And then the other reason was there was a real loss of the major clock uh, guys within like 100 miles of our shop. So as we came out of the recession, there were customers, regular customers of other clock people who came to us because their clock guy wasn't there anymore. And so we saw a spike in, in work that we had never seen before. And of course, my dad uh, reminded me that he had told me that, which <laughs> he, certainly had, he certainly had a right to. Um, so we, um, so we got real busy again. And anyway, back to his ashes, um, as I have decided, and, and we had a little, a little bit of crew. I had lost all of my full, full-time employees during the recession. And then as we're coming towards the tail end of the recession, there were some customers that showed an interest in learning more about clocks. And so I, um, 
I told them, I said, hey, if you want to learn more about it, just come on in. I got some extra bench space and I'll show you, there are no secrets, I'll show you everything about um, the process that, that uh, we honed over the last 65 years. And so I had a few part-times that started coming in and uh, they helped me decide that to keep the shop open. They're like, look, you're really busy. You got, um, you know, we're having fun, which is our number one priority at Void Clocks, to have fun. If you're not having fun, oh, why bother? And so then, um, so we decided to just to keep it going. And uh, we spent six months finding a, a, a property, a, a space that would suit us because we had downsized because of the recession to survive it. And, uh, and now we were very busy and needed a much larger facility. So six months later, we found a, a facility and we start moving all the parts out of, of Grandpa's shop and all the parts and tools out of my shop. And I run into Grandpa's ashes in his shop. I'm thinking, well, why are, why are Dad's ashes in the shop? So I called my mom and I said, hey, um, what do you want me to do with grandpa's ashes and why are they in his shop and she said well I don't know why they're, they're in the shop you need to call your sister um, so I called my sister Betsy and I said hey um, what do you want me to do with grandpa's ashes and why are they in the shop and she said I don't know why they're in the shop you need to call mom I said well I just got off the phone with mom so I thought to myself you know what that would be just like grandpa wanting to be in the clock shop even after his death somehow yeah. i like the idea of thinking that somehow he, he found a way he, he made his way back into the shop yeah. and so uh um and then later on come to find out my mom had changed her mind about not wanting to be cremated she wanted to have a casket and go up to some old our old family um graveyard plots up in illinois and uh, so then I thought, oh, great, we didn't scatter Dad's ashes. Uh, he can go up there and be with her. So that all kind of worked out. But it makes for a good story. In the meantime, Grandpa is here with us in the clock shop up on the shelves near Seth Thomas, which is his favorite maker, uh, until the day comes that he will go to his final resting place up in Galesburg, Illinois. So I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, yes, I started very young myself. I grew up in this clock shop. Um, I was rebuilding, no, not rebuilding, sorry. I was repairing, simple repairs. Actually, no, it was rebuilding. My first clocks were, oh, let's say 1966, 1967. Uh, the average American kitchen had a little electric clock up on the wall with a cord coming down, had two clusters of gears and a little motor. And at a very young age, I would take that apart, clean it, take the motor apart, um, clean it, repack it with grease, reassemble it, and, and put the two little gear, gear clusters together, put the, the movement back together, put it back in the clock, and I might make a dollar. And uh, so at the end of a week, at seven or eight years old, I might have two or three dollars in my pocket. And this is back when you could walk into a, a five and dime, and comic books were 10 cents, the little balsa wood gliders were 10 cents, you could get pixie sticks and gumballs for a penny, and I could walk out of that place with my pockets full. and. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I was overwhelmed with the, the work. I remember thinking that was, you know, it was just too, I remember being kind of frustrated with uh, those clocks, but I was young and, and it, was, it was a good starting place. Now, because grandpa was in a wheelchair, I used to go on house calls with him. And I went on house calls, um, you know, primarily for grandfather clocks. You don't want somebody bringing their grandfather clock into the house. We go to their house, I mean bring their grandfather clock into the shop, we go to their house to work on grandfather clocks. Now dad's in a wheelchair, so I would help him up the stairs of the house, and this is starting seven, eight, nine, ten years old, and then once we're in the house, I would take the weights and pendulum and dial and hands off of the clock and then take the movement out, hand him the movement, he would clean it and oil it, and I'd put it back, and I, he would also talk me through making the adjustments so that it had a nice even beat and, and level and that kind of stuff. Um, so by the time I was 16 years old and could drive, Grandpa said, oh, you're on your own. Well, I didn't know any better. My brother and I still laugh about it because he did the same thing with my <laughs> younger brother. Thinking about the uh, looks on some of the customers' faces as a 16-year-old kid goes to the, comes to the door to work on their nice old family grandfather clock. Now, Dave, can you put it into perspective? Um, 
back then, how much would a grandfather clock cost for someone to place one in their home? Um, the average grandfather clock was probably uh, fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars. Um, and how much would an average American make in a year? Gosh, good question. Late 60s, uh, early 70s, you know, what, a half or maybe a third of what they do today? Okay. Now, now this was an investment, you know, and, right, and right. in the 60s and 70s, you had to have mechanical clocks in your house to know what time it was. This was, um, now, you could say, hey, what about the electric clocks? You know, even your stove might have had an electric clock. Those were still mechanical. It wasn't like today where you have uh, quartz or you know GPS time on your microwave and your stove and some refrigerators and you know when when the first of the cable first of cable came out the cable boxes had time and you know we started getting free time but that was in uh, you know early 80s when we started getting as much free time you know our our beepers had the time on them um, you know but in the in the 60s and 70s we were still living in the world of mechanical time. So a grandfather clock was, was a serious investment for like o almost as much as like you could put it on the same line as maybe a car or not as much? Not as much as a car. However, there were grandfather clocks out there that were very expensive that would be more expensive than maybe a cheap uh, car. Um, but those were, you know, for people that really wanted to spend some money on a really nice house that went into a, I mean on, on a really nice clock that went into a really nice house. Um, but these were ne these were necessary household items. And then you were 16 years old working on something of that much value. Yes, I could easily be working on what in today's um, market would be a seven or eight thousand dollar clock at 16 years old. Okay. Now I don't remember any customers complaining or any time that my father had to go back and work on some. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. I'm sure there were some sketchy jobs early on. But that was where I began, you know. So here I am. Uh, let's see, uh, 42 years after um, later that I'm st I'm still doing house calls. In fact, I'm doing more house calls now than I just about ever have, uh, three or four per day. Um, you know, but I started really young, and and once my brother and I were able to do the house calls, my my father did not go out for house calls anymore, and he pretty much stayed in the shop, which was easier for him being in a wheelchair. Okay, so. Um, I started my first clock shop, um, it was 30 years ago this year, I think, yeah, 19, yeah, 89, um, and uh, I didn't know anything about it, business that is. I knew about the clocks, but I didn't know about business, but I figured at uh, 27 years old, I would, I would be young enough to survive it, um, and um, in some ways, I was wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> you never really were. No. <laughs> no. Small business, man. I've got to hand it to all the it's, small businesses across the United States. It's a killer. Oh, wow. Jeez. It's still tough. You know, I'm working six, seven days a week, which I'm fine with because I love to work. And I love the clocks. I thought I'd kind of be burned out by on clocks by now. But the older I get, the more I appreciate the artistry and the ingenuity and just the, the ideas that different guys came up with. And John and I were talking just a little bit ago. We sold one of the clocks that he loved. And I have to admit, I loved it too. Um, it was a really, really cool tall case clock. Um, it was uh, 1763 yep. was the date uh, that it was made. But it had some really cool paintings on it. And somebody had really done an amazing job of doing a fine gold leaf type of filigree all over the whole thing. It was beautiful. And um, I liked it enough so that when I purchased it, I actually gave it to one of our crew as a birthday present so it would quote unquote stay in the family. Uh, but a customer came in uh, here some, uh, not long ago, I mean, you know, we're talking about a week or two weeks ago, a customer came in and they fell in love with it. So Angel, or uh, the guy that I had given it to for his birthday, came up to me and said, um, Dave, I know you gave me this clock, but there's some people here that really love it. And I said, hey, man, sell it. You know, I personally don't have a clock collection anymore. I walked into my house uh, about 20 years ago, and I stopped in my tracks. And I looked around and took a breath, and I thought, I'm turning into my dad. Because <laughs> they were everywhere. There were too many of them. And, uh, JR, I can tell you about uh, Grandpa's house. 
Yeah, I mean, I remember even on Sterling, one of their one of their later homes, there were, you know, I mean, at least five clocks in the bathroom. So you're going to you're going to you're going to you're going to number one or number two, and there's a cuckoo that's that's coming out at you when you're on the toilet, somewhat uncomfortable. Um, but I, I mean, Grandpa loved loved clocks, just like Angel, one of the guys who's on right now. He loves clocks, and both of them they would just cram as many clocks as they as they could um, into whatever space they had in their homes because it's like every waking moment, every second they. They want to look and see a clock, no matter where they are in the house or what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, and and uh, it it's a little overwhelming. It's a little overwhelming for it for someone who isn't com as into clocks as they are. One of the big clues of someone who might be into clocks a little too much is when they decide. Let's say they get a new wall clock and they decide to take the family portrait off of the wall hang because <laughs> to hang. Another clock. <laughs> it might be clock number 25 for that room. Might be only clock 15. But the fact that they trade up the family portrait <laughs> for yet another clock is a clue that it may be a little bit much. Now I call those people, the people that have like a hundred clocks or more, I call them clock nuts. And I say that lovingly. My father was a clock nut. But when I walked into my house, you know, 20 years ago or so and saw what I was starting to do, I decided I wasn't going to do that. I'm around them all day long. This shop is full of clocks. There's got to be several thousand clocks here at least, not even counting a lot of the stuff that are in boxes for parts or what have you. And um, so I sold my very favorite clock first, and I know that sounds like you'd sell that one last, but I sold it first because I figured get if I can get over the pain, the, the, the attachment of um, you know something materialistic, then uh, the rest of it would be easy. And it was. And my favorite clock went to a wonderful home. So that made everything else easy. Everything else just went. And I've got one clock now that I like. And if somebody wanted to buy it, I would sell it. But I'm around them. I'm around some amazing clocks. We have a clock over here uh, next to John that is, I guess it's around 500 years old. And it's wrought iron instead of cast iron, which means it was made by a blacksmith. And, there, and it's a tower clock. And it's a, a foliate clock. It does not have a pendulum. Galileo came, came up with a pendulum idea in 1602. He wrote in his notes that he was watching the chandelier swing, and the longer ones um, took longer to swing back and forth than the shorter ones. And the ones that were at the same rate, um, I mean, at the same length, would swing at the same rate, whether they were swinging a lot or just a little bit. And Galileo wrote in his notes he thought that might make for good timekeeping. So this clock next to John was made before that, and it has a little bar with weights on it that goes back and forth, and if the little bars are closer, uh, it goes faster than if they're farther apart. Terrible timekeeper, but it's really cool to have in here. Um, JR can tell you a story about how we got it. It's uh, more of a saga, really, than a story. Well, another good, another good way we have of dating the clock is be there's no nails or screws in it. All the, all the pieces are made to fit together and they didn't have because they didn't have they they didn't have the ability to use either one of those things effectively with the the technology that they had at the time. Yeah, so they've got pins and shims, and right. uh, some of the pieces are dovetailed and really cool stuff. And and to imagine a, a it's also not in frame. They can't see it. Oh well, John's saying well, they can't see. It. No, we will do an, a separate story. It, it, it will be its own video. Yeah, it is. We will do a separate story on the, clock the two tower, tower clocks that we have in here, uh, both of which are wrought iron, and um, both of which are running. And we didn't restore the really old one because that a really nice. It's got a really nice patina on it. Supposedly, it sat in the basement of a French church for about 400 years in disrepair. But anyway, we'll do videos on those. Um, but JR, if you want, you can tell them real quick about the story. Uh, the story of our drive out to El Paso? Well, yeah. I've been looking for a, 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 a turret clock. Turret, I believe, is French for tower. Uh, um, with a foliate escapement. For, so my search words for um, the internet were foliate and turret clock. Not common Joe homeowner uh terms uh, to describe a clock um, but after searching for maybe 10 years I find one and on eBay on eBay 
And, uh, but, but I, gosh, he wanted quite a bit for it. And I was like, wow, uh, let me just make him a low ball offer. And, and he didn't respond to any of my low ball offers. And finally, it's off of the internet or off of eBay. And so I sent him a, a message saying, hey, if, if you would be so kind as to forward my information to the buyer, I'd be glad to pay him a little bit more. And he emailed me back saying, no, nobody wants to pay what I think it's worth. So he, I'm going to keep it for a while. It was uh, the last tower clock that he had of his collection. He was in the military in Europe for 30 years and collected old tower clocks while he was over there. And this was his last one. So he thought, you know what? Uh, and uh, and I told him right then and there, hey, I'd be glad to give you what you want for it. And he said, no, no, I'm, I'm going um, to hang on to it. So I thought, well, rats, I was so close to having a real treasure. Anyway, two years later, it comes back on there, I'm back on the, the, the Internet. And this time he wants even more. And I'm like, oh, geez. I was restoring a 1972 Corvette convertible at the time, and I went out and kissed that car goodbye. Sold it, and with that money, JR and I, oh, I told the guy I would pay him, you know, what he wanted for it. But I wasn't going to trust crating and shipping and all that. So JR and I took off for El Paso, Texas to go pick this up. A th uh, yeah, a 3,500 mile round trip from Tampa, Florida, or at least 11,620 North Florida Avenue, Tampa, Florida. And we did, 30, we did all 3,500 miles in uh, 52 hours. That's including stops. So we were booking it. <laughs> no, we were going to speed up. Right. Oh, yeah. Our, our, our <laughs> well, you'd be you'd be surprised how fast the speed limit is in you, Texas. Yeah, you that's said, a big state. You, that's a big state. You said you were averaging seventy five the whole time. <laughs> well, we were after, averaging at least seventy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Our producer has uh, instructed us that we were going the speed limit. So uh, we were going the speed limit apparently, um, but we ran into everything that could go wrong went wrong. We had van troubles at one time. At one point in the middle, it, and it rained like half of the trip. And at one point, um, I'm going like, uh, I think the speed limit might have been 80 going across some of the, the, yeah. the yeah. areas of Texas. Texas has 80 miles per hour. Wow. Speed so I'm areas. going like 80 miles an hour in the middle of the night in the rain. And my windshield wiper all of a sudden goes flying off. So here I am blind in the middle of the night in Texas going 80 miles an hour. I have to lean way over and look out of JR's window. Of course, he's, he's got his head back in a deep sleep. <laughs> and... Um, Gosh, we just, and then the van didn't want to run nice. So there was very little, you know, good rest in this trip. And on the way back, I was going to be driving the midnight shift or the graveyard shift. So I was supposed, this on the way back. So we had this old tower clock in the van with us. And I was supposed to, in the, in the late afternoon e and evening, I was supposed to go back and sleep next to it so I could be rested. I was too excited. I was like, this clock is historic. I can't sleep next to the thing. I was too excited, so I just rested. And uh, holy cow, that was a tough trip. We were um, we were pretty beat by the time we got back, and have since decided we're not going to do any more trips like that. We're going to figure out maybe pay someone who hasn't done that kind of trip to go do it or something. Well, if if you do it like a normal person and take a couple days each way, stay at a hotel and like. You know, like a normal person, you don't have to cannonball it the whole way. Now, John, you probably know by now, clock people don't really fall into the, the normal I'm, person. I'm category. well aware. Like I, I, I I've, <laughs> I've been here more than one day, or actually more than five minutes. Um, <laughs> but like, you're right. You're right. You had to get a hotel like, like and cannonballing it from here to Texas. I, I mean, it's. It's not. Well, we wanted it's to feel a 24 hour trip. it. We wanted to feel it. We wanted to feel. We, we wanted, wanted to feel to like know. we had done something historic <laughs> for a historic clock. Right. We wanted to feel like you know, like Lewis and Clark, out and out and up on the plains I, I, with I, the with the wild ox and deer. I will say though. <laughs> I will say though. The, the 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 record was just set from from New York to L. A. I saw that and they beat it by like 27 hours. They beat it by like half an hour or something yeah. crazy. They, Wait, they have races? Is it? Oh, Cannonball Run. It is, no, no, it's not the Cannonball Run. I thought this, it was Cannonball this, this, this Run. Is, this is an unofficial race that has unofficial times, but they but they log it by GPS. Right. This is has nothing to do with clocks, but this is something I follow. And it's really neat. So it's done in traffic and everything. It's oh, not yeah. like a race course. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. They were averaging like 100 miles an hour. No, it's much faster than that. 
Oh my god. You have to average like 140 something miles an hour to do this. Oh, you're kidding. 27 hours New York to LA. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, it makes sense because across the country is what, over 3,000? Yeah, yeah. No, no meme intended, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. Like, thinking about doing that, ridiculous. The, The last, the guys who I know that did it before did it in a souped up Mercedes. With with two with two spare gas tanks, night vision, um, police scanners. They right, had they had right. an airplane with them <laughs> to fly ahead. Like I don't I, the story these, the, the the story for these guys. I don't know if it, if it's out yet, but but the, the official report that they did it with the time slip is out. I, I don't know if the whole story is out yet. I'm waiting for Ed Bullion to do a story about it. He's he's the guy that helped do the, the one previous. No, I'm sitting it's, here thinking, how are we going to tie that story into the clock business? It has nothing to do with clocks. No, no, I found a way to tie All it in. All will be clear in post-production. Oh, no, no, I, no. Found, I found a way to tie it in. I, we've got car clocks back there. They could have no, timed no, car clocks. No, I found the way no, to do up. it. <laughs> I, I found the way to tie this in. How do we know that they beat the record by half an hour? Because they were timing it. And what were they timing it with? A very highly accurate a electric very, clock. That is correct. <laughs> they were using a clock. <laughs> yep, they know what time they left because they're using a clock. Now, all the clocks that they're using and timing is all digital now and GPS oh, yes. time. However, that leads us back to a, another interesting story, which is it um, the branch in the evolution of timekeeping mechanisms, timekeeping machinery. Um, that led us to where we are today is the branch of electric clocks, you know, which led to courts and so on and so forth. That branch started in like 1825. These cats were burying zinc plates in the ground with horse urine to come up with 1.5 volts to try to get away from the limitations of timekeeping with mechanical clocks due to temperature change. Now, 1825, 1800, whatever, take your pick. If it, you're up in Illinois or Chicago or whatever and it's cold in the winter, chances are by four o'clock in the morning it's pretty cold in your house if you were, depending on fireplaces. And uh, in the middle of the summer you had your windows open. If it was hot outside, it was hot in the house. Now those are big temperature changes um, that people had to deal with on a regular basis, not thinking anything of it. They didn't know when, you know, central heat and air uh, was coming and, and, and probably uh, most people didn't even imagine it would happen. In the meantime, clocks were affected um, by those time changes and it's mainly because of the length of the pendulum, which controls the timekeeping. If it's a hot day, believe it or not, the, the pendulum rod, whether it's wood or metal or what have you, would expand enough to slow the clock down maybe up to five minutes a week. And in the winter, it would shrink up um, because of the temperature to the point that the clock might run fast up to five minutes a week. Well, if you're running a a railroad system or a school or a university or any, anything where you really need to, you know, newspaper, whatever, where you really need to know the, the right time within seconds, preferably, um, temperature was messing this up. And uh, so the best of the timekeepers way back then were clocks that were sealed away into, um, you know, temperature controlled situations. And that was just for like maybe some kind of a master time, um, you know, for the United States. Um, And so there were people that were working on trying to get away from uh, the the differences in in timekeeping because of temperature. And so electricity is not affected uh, by temperature uh, anywhere near the, the way that machinery is. And so here we were, 1825, guys are making their own batteries to try to figure out how to get away from the limits of, of machinery, uh, clock mechanics because of temperature. And it took them, a, it took them quite a while. Um, but believe it or not, the first of the quartz clocks was in the 30s. But the, the, the technology, it was kind of like the early computers. It was, it was huge and expensive. And there was no way Joe Homeowner was going to be using it. And it took a good you know, 60 years or, or 50 years anyway to get to the size where you know, it's a, a battery 
little plastic box that, that holds a double-A battery um, to, so that we can have nice time in our homes without worrying about temperature change. And of course it changed also with um, having our houses temperature controlled with central heat and air and that, that helped with the time uh, keeping. But the change, had, the, the branch and the evolution of clock making had already taken place and that's where we are today. Our GPS time, our atomic time, uh, these are all things that uh, unfolded over a long period of time, uh, but started pretty much in the 20s and 30s. We had atomic time in the 20s and 30s, and um, and quartz time in the 20s and 30s. But it was they, these were massive pieces of machinery and not readily available at all to the public. And uh, so there's this long evolution of of timekeeping, and now all the mechanical stuff's obsolete. You know, we don't use it, and and that's where. Um, the kids today, they're not going to be, the average American under 50 years old is not going to be buying a mechanical clock. It's obsolete. Um, uh, they don't need it, and it is going the way of maps and, and encyclopedias and, and all of that. However, the, <clears throat> the only place you see mechanical time these days in a, in a new setting is, in my opinion, watches, um, especially in higher-end watches. Um, it's pretty much the only thing you see in higher end watches. Yeah, and watches, that's an interesting, that's an interesting phenomenon for me too. You can go online and buy a watch tonight for half a million dollars. And it's mechanical. No problem. Um, but there, I think there are several reasons that, that watches, you can still buy very expensive watches. Now we're around some amazing clocks. There's, there's a clock, uh, we'll do a feature uh, presentation on it sometime, but there's a, a clock, you know, seven feet away from me that was made 300 years ago. It's completely covered in inlay. Um, it's got Amsterdam uh, on the dial, so you know it's made in Amsterdam. And um, it might be a $30,000 clock, It's, uh, but that's way up there in the values of clocks. And yet $30,000 in the watch world is, you can go to a, a jewelry store in your local mall and find a watch for over thirty thousand dollars and here I am with some historic pieces and and that's going to be one of the most expensive clocks in the shop our average clock in here um, I've got we've got quite a few clocks that are way over 200 years old and we're not gonna be able to get three thousand dollars for them and they're pretty amazing clocks oh the clock that John really loved yeah sold for twenty four hundred dollars and it was amazing two hundred and 60, 207, yeah, 260 years old, amazing clock, um, gorgeous, $2,400. And I mean, that barely gets you into the watch world at all. Mm. And yeah, yet they're- That'll you, get you a nice, it'll get you a nice watch, but that's about it. That's about it. And that nice watch might be battery operated. It might be, you know, <laughs> it, it, I don't know if you can get a nice mechanical watch. You can get a nice mechanical can you? Okay, see, I'm out of the watch world. Yeah, no, no, you can get a nice mechanical watch, but it'll it'll be from like a a um, like a mall brand. See, that's um, that's a low it, end I, mechanical I, watch. I definitely it's, think it's so. not going to be from one of your boutiques. It's not going to have a tourbillon. It's it's not going to have something like that. Um, it, it's going to definitely be a or or it's going to be one of your solar powered like your um uh oh god the the name is escaping. It could be one of the solar powered watches that, yeah. that, that never have to be wound or anything. Oh, they wind them self winding. No, no, no. They're, they're solar. Self powered. The, 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 the dial is yeah. actually a solar panel. Right, right. right. Yeah. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, no, so it, to me, it's a phenomenon that, that clocks, some amazing clocks, are so inexpensive or valued for so little compared to some mid range watches that could be. Twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. Um, I mean, I think that you know, at this point, the biggest part of it is now that neither one of them are useful in a purely utility sense. Both of them, their worth comes from kind of the what with um, the aesthetic, the look of it in general, and also kind of the just the 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 very kind of like pride or you know what someone would think of you just for owning one of them. Mm -hmm. And you can't take a, you can't take a <laughs> clock to a job interview. Right, so you're talking you, about this is kind of a status symbol. Right. And jewelry. 
And, it, and it's a look. It's a you, look. You can't yeah. take that look. You, if, you're, if you're buying a clock, you can't take that look to a job interview. You can't take right. that look on a date. There's one way you can, and that's with a watch. Yeah. And so I think that's the biggest difference. We gotta we got we gotta set, we gotta upsell the clock idea, not the watch idea. <laughs> well, that's what we're that's what we're doing here. But it makes sense. No, it, that's it, what it we're doing here. Sense. We're trying to to uh, really rekindle because it has died back so much. We're trying to rekindle the excitement of of clocks, and part of it is because there is reason to be excited about clocks in that there are some amazing clocks out there. And I, I, I love the history about it. Like each one of these tells a really neat story. Like this one, this one right over here, right, right behind JR's, uh, JR's back, I believe has a hand painted face. It does. And, yeah. and we could do a story on that clock. That, that particular that is so incredibly neat. Yeah, there were families, um, and they could be ca called dial houses. Families that that's all they did was painted dials. That is that is so incredibly neat. And that particular clock is uh, 1820, so it is right at 200 years old. Runs very nice. Now, how many pieces of machinery do any of us know that are two or 300 years old that run really nice? The only thing you're gonna find that does that is large scale machinery. So big, big factory machines. Yeah, maybe some old tractors. Yeah, tractors. Um, well, like that. but we're track. No, wait, we're um, you know mechanical tractors even around 200 years ago. Cars, the first of the automobiles, were oh, yeah. um, no, were like what. Uh, 1880, 1890, and, and not That's even true. and yeah. not even called automobiles. So, so They're we're, horseless carriages. We're, we're looking at big factory machines, you know, and presses. And how many like of that. those things are still running, you know? And some of our some of the clock stuff, um, the history of clocks goes back. Uh, the first of the tower clocks, I believe, and they were the first clocks, uh, was 1325. I think was the very first clock as we know it was ever made. And so we have a 700-year history of clocks as opposed to maybe a 140-year history of cars. And the history of cars is fascinating. But man, a 700-year history of machinery and mechanics, fascinating. And a lot of these guys really poured their talents into it. So you can get a clock that, yeah, it keeps nice time, but it is gorgeous. It's made out of marble or bronze or brass, wood, glass, you know, all kinds of different configurations. Some of the, um, um, you know, like a baker's clock. I'm looking past the camera at a clock that has got uh, tortoise shell, um, porcelain, uh, stone, um, melted glass. Is that what that, that one is on the wall? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, you know, of course, brass for the, the, the plates and the gears, steel for the hands, the case is wood, glass for the dial, um, and, and it's everything's inlaid. It's just covered with all these different um, products, and it's gorgeous. It didn't have to be gorgeous, but it is. It's stunning. And and really, all these other things that we're talking about, cars, watches, you know, it's it's important to to keep it in perspective that uh, really so much, all those things, and so much machinery since has come from the, the things, the principles that were initially discovered when creating clocks. Clocks were the forerunner of so many different instruments, so many different mechanical instruments that are in use today, that have, you know, that are still a big part of society no, that's a, and, and how we, you know, yeah. live our daily lives. That's a huge point. Uh, this, mm -hmm. this old tower clock next to me that's uh, somewhere around 500 years old, that's the beginning of the Mercedes automatic five-speed. You know, the technology started, um, you know, back with clocks and basically everything mechanical that we use today, all the way from electric drills to, you know, our, our gosh, you name it, our cars and our air conditioning, you know, the machinery, uh, the mechanics, uh, started with clock gearing and clock technology. Great point. And so, you know, if we're, if, What's the famous quote? Uh, we're, we're standing on the uh, shoulders of giants. If if that if we're talking about machinery, those giants, the shoulders that so much much of machinery that has come um, since clocks, they have all stood on the shoulders of the clocks and the machinery that were initially was put into them, and then you know 
during the process of hundreds of years evolved and you know gradually adapted and became superior over time and as a result of that process they were able to come up with other ways to use those gears and use those machines not just purely to tell time but you know to do other things as well so if it wasn't for them you know there's 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 no telling where we'd be there's no telling where we'd be and so it would be wrong to say that you know even today that clocks aren't important just because we don't use them to tell time because they it's an important it's, history. They, yeah, they represent so much more than yeah. just what they do, but also they represent an important part of how we got to where we are today. No, good point. Um, I believe, and anybody wants to uh, email or uh, text to correct me, I believe the very first clock was designed by a monk who got together with a blacksmith to help him make it. And this would have been from the uh, 1325 clock. We don't have that, that clock is, is not in existence uh, that we know of, but the drawings and the plans and then the discussions of, the, the paperwork for all that still exists and that's over in Europe. Um, so we think that's a, that's, that was the first mechanical clock as, as we know it today. And of course, you know, if you go back, there were other, um, you can go back a lot further into history to see other ways that we were keeping time with, you know, hourglasses and sundials and, and um, uh, things of that nature, water clocks. Um, but the mechanics, that's where, that's, that's the world that we live in, uh, these mechanical clocks. And there's some cool stuff. So that's what we're trying to do. Tell you about the shop and the legacy that David Nelson Boyd has uh, left behind and get people kind of interested in some of these really cool clocks.